This is officially part two of uh, chapter eight to say from Lachim Aleph. But of course, um, we don't exactly always learn in a linear manner. I try to stay anchored in the in the 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 progression of Prakim. But here I told mentioned already last week that we were going to focus on one theme. I'm doubling back. We're going to start chapter eight again. I want to show you a few things to consider in it, beginning with the pasuk that appears at the end of chapter seven. That's uh, page 413 in the Korentanach Hebrew English, the non Magerman, Magerman, Magerman edition, the old one, the one published in the 90s. And um, if you don't have that, you can look up in any Tanakh, 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, chapter 7, excuse me, verse 51. But the Shlam Kolam Lachasher Asa Melech Shlomo Beit Hashem, we have a Shlomet Kodshe David Aviv, at a Kesev, at a Zahav, at a Kilim Natan, but also at Beit Hashem. All of the work that Shlomo had done uh, for the house of God, it was all completed. And Shlomo brought that which was sanctified, consecrated is probably the better word, by his father David. The silver, the gold, all of the utensils he put in the treasure house of the house of Hashem. Right here, the Madras, we're breaking it right away to a Madras, uh, uh, I would say fairly, uh, fairly early on in the, uh, in the, in the shear here. Um, if you look at the, hold on, we get it on the screen. There we are. Uh, let me close this and make it a little bit bigger. Already the Alkut Shimoni explains the following. It doesn't say he finished all the work, but rather the Lashon, this, the language specifically is Kol Hamlacha. All of the work, all of the work. He could have just said, the job was done. But Tishlam Kol Avoda means it's Kol Malacha Melechet Sheishin Me Breishit Shleima. The work of the six days of creation was now complete. There's some kind of cosmic process that's concluding or culminating, rather, right here before our eyes. Mikol Malachto Ashabara Elokim Laasot at the end of Masa Breishin and Sefer Breishit. We say it every Friday in Kiddush. I don't think we have to look it up, right? But everything that God did to make. It's not that, uh, that God, it should have said by, by the laws of the language, he would have thought it said, um, uh, he did it, but it's lasot is to do something in the future. He did? No. It says lasot, still to make something, to do something. There's other work. What other work is that after the whole world has been created in its natural uh, 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 dimensions, right? And it was sanctified. The day of Shabbat was sanctified, and that concluded it. But it's still to do something. Uh, now that Shlomo came and he built the Beit Hamikdash, he built a place, a location that is the 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 portal, if you will, for relationship with Hashem, built by human hands, but already conceived of for the beginning of creation. That's this madrash. Okay, Shem said, now, Shlema, complete, is the work of Shemaim and Aretz. And of course, you probably figured it out by now. We're learning together long enough. Lekach nikra Shlomo. And that's why his name was Shlomo. Not if just for the sake of peace, but the word peace itself implies, not implies, it means wholeness, completion. And therefore, he's called Shlomo. Shlema, Kodesh Baruch, Malachat, Sheh, Shemei, Breshit, Letoch, Adav. Hashem allowed the completion of all of creation, the six days of creation, into the hands of Shlomo HaMelech. And of course, you should be rightly asking yourself, um, it's a long way into human history. Uh, but the question sometimes becomes the exclamation point. It is a long way into human history. And the notion that processes of development uh, within the progression of history are going to take time, sometimes a very long time. And the key piece here is, if Hashem really wanted there to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, an environment where it would be so easy to interact with Hashem on, a, on an ongoing personal basis without the need for the recourse for any barriers, and there was no, um, what's the word, <clears throat> there was no hiddenness in the world, he could have made such a place. He did make such a place. That's what Gan Eden was. Didn't work out. So, right, it's the exile from the Gan, 
If we wanted to spend more time on it now, I won't spend more time on it now because I spoke about it a few years ago. Not that anybody remembers, not even me, but there was a whole series about um, the Garden of Eden. And I tried to connect each of them and told them to Garden of Eden. It's not very hard to do. There's a lot of writing. That's that's If that's the first story in Tanakh, that becomes very much a foundational story of things that will come after. And this is the end of the creation. If you actually look at the progression uh, of how things uh, go, so we have uh, six days of creation, culminating in Shabbat. The human being is created on the sixth day. The chait, according to Pirkei Jebeliezer and the Midrashim, happens on the sixth day, which I could just as easily say in the final phase, the final era of the period known of the period as the period of creation, described to us in our language as six days, since that makes it, that's something we can all understand. And you can be five years old and understand, oh, Hashem made it in six days. And that also explains to us the, the structure of our life. Six days and the seventh day is Shabbat. Uh, Adam and Chava get some kind of reprieve. They're allowed to stay in Gan Eden for Shabbat. After Shabbat, it's the beginning of a new week. The exile happens. And then they're building a life that will culminate again in Shabbat outside of the Gan. That's in time and in space. So the, the sort of the break between those two, time and space, if you will, the two dimensions are united. The place to meet Hashem, Gan Eden, the time to meet Hashem, specifically Shabbat. And the, that doesn't work out. Now, what would have been counterfactual? Had there not been a sin? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's counterfactual. You can start, make up anything you want. Who knows? Would it have, that have been already the Yom Shekulot Shabbat? That would have been the day that is completely Shabbat that we speak about in Berkat Amazon, which is a reference to the Gemara and Avodah Zarah and several other places. It refers to the idea of the world as 6,000 years. And then the 7,000th year is the Yom Shekulot Shabbat. is the day that's all Shabbat. We don't even know what that means. Sometimes people ask me about it and say, we'll find out. Well, we have what we have in this farm. But beyond that, we have no idea. Um, here, this is the return to an Edenic uh, 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 existence, if you will. If you look at Gan Eden, what's at the end of the story where they're being thrown out? God puts Kruvim there, right? Then there's some kind of sword, swords, they're fiery swords preventing the entry into it. But the notion of Kruvim already appears there. And of course, we already read about it. We're going to read about it again. But the idea that the Kruvim are also implanted on the ground, right? And, and that connected to the terra firma of Eretz Yisrael, Yerushalayim, Yerach Kodesh, the Har Habayit, the Makam HaMikdash. Um, and Karen points out quite accurately, right, and these are also beginnings. That's so, that notion that there is something cyclical, but it's not It's not cyclical on simply on, on, on the plane, uh, on the same x-axis, on the same level of the y-axis, I should say. There's, it's, it's, it's cyclical, but it's moving up. Uh, I, I think later on there would be a, uh, a, a philosopher by the name of Hegel who would talk about this a process of history, but there, there, there is something to that within uh, within our understanding of uh, of human history. In other words, we, we, it does it is coming full circle, but we're not in the same place. Even though we came back to the point, same point in the circle, we're higher up. We're later on. Something else has changed. Shelley, go yeah. ahead. Please ask. Um, okay, but you still one is you have the Mishkan, which is a place to um, interact with God. Yeah. And two, you have to deal with the fact that it fell apart so quickly. It, there's no, you, you can't, the, the 12 tribes disintegrate. The 12 tribes as a unity are very essential to the future. So even if the Beit Hamikdash uh, stands in, 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 Jew, in Yehuda, and, 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 and you got some good kings, you got some bad kings, you don't have all the people there. So you've got, you do have no completion. Right, right. So on your, fir on, your, on your first point, I skipped over the Mishkan, but of course I could have said all this about the Mishkan. Yes, the point is though the Mishkan is moving place to place and now we've arrived. This was the point. Like why did they build a Mishkan? Because maybe it was going to take a little longer to get to the point where they were going to be building a mikdash, uh, maybe, and it took way longer, as it turns out. Why? Because of the human factor, the reality that a Kaddish Baruch Hu still 
and all these stories. Everything's in the hands of heaven, everything, except for one thing, the fear of heaven. The fear of heaven means the moral choices. The fear of heaven means the volitional choices that relates to spirituality, morality, connection to Hashem himself. That's where the human freedom exists. And if the people are not going to be able to get along, which is an aspect of your at Shamayim, be able to see that Selim Elohim in the other, beginning with one's own kith and kin, then fine. It will take longer or it won't work out, or it looks like it's finished, but it's not finished. And here we come, and we'll, we'll, I don't want to go down into this too far, because we will be spending most of the rest of the next years focused on how badly it all went. But at this moment, when Shlomo Melech is building and now inaugurating the Beit HaMikdash, they think, erroneously, but they think we've arrived. And we learn this message again and again and again is, yeah, you've arrived, but it's not the end. And the end is not the end. The end is, as Karen pointed out, it's already a new beginning. Karen, you right. want to say something about this? I just wanted to say that I meant beginnings like Heraclitus, where you can't step in the same river twice. Twice, yeah. Okay. That um, beginnings don't necessarily mean returns to where you were before. We read the Torah every year, and it's new every year because we're new every year. Yeah. So we right. have this cycle in our history of exile and return, both within us and as a as a people, and physically and spiritually. It's just it's that moving out and moving back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe, I believe so. And by the way, that, that's what puts, that's what gives us the, the a real, a real, it's a real challenge. Uh, but that, that is, we see the message again and again and again, that this is, this is our responsibility. Right. And if we, if we, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, if, if we, we do what we need to do. Great. And if not, there's a consequence, a consequences. Um, and, um, and right here in this Pasuk, though, you know, Chazal, at least the, the al Shimoni, like that's why it's a Pasuk, which is also a little Parshia. It's like on its own, the tab space before, the tab space after, just to realize, right? And where is all of the, all of the wealth going? It's into the Otsur Beit Hashem. Then Shlomo gathered all the people, Parakhet. We read this last time, so it's kind of Chazara, but now I'm reading it with another lens uh, in. The focus is on the gathering of the people. As Shelley pointed out, you need all 12 tribes. So you got all the leadership, and they're bringing the Aaron Brit Hashem up to uh to uh to Yerushalayim Israel so we have all the people arriving. They're gathering. It's the holiday of Sukkot. It's the seventh month. It's the month of the mighty ones. The priests, the Kohanim, bring it. The the um, the uh, the elders are all there. By Yalu at Aaron Hashem. The word Aaron is coming up again and again. The Aaron Brit Hashem. Aaron Hashem. By Yalu at Aaron Hashem. That all Amoe. That Kol Klei Hakodesh Sher Ba Ohel. Again, again, the, the Kohanim and the Levim are doing it. The Zikanim are there, right? That, that was what our shir was about last time, about all the offerings and the right, the dedication uh, having to do with Chanukat HaMizbeah specifically, and the, 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 the overflow of Kedusha, of Kedushat Makom. And, and we see there, there's so many uh, korbanot, the Kohanim bring the Aaron Brit Hashem, this Ark of the Covenant of Hashem, to its place. What is its place? On one level, it's the place that they built for it. On another level, it sounds maybe like it was a place that was already designated from before. El Dvir Habayit to the Kodesh Kodashim. The Dvir Habayit is the Kodesh Kodashim. Again, we talked about this before. There's some ambiguity as the Dvir, the Gemara is debating this, Masachet Yuma, Larry and I learned a few years ago together, uh, is the Dvir the, the passageway in, like the, the doorway, uh, the lintel, you have to cross over the, to the threshold, or the, the lintel and the threshold in that area, that's the, the, the it's one ama thick, or is the Dvir Habayit the inside of it? And part of that debate 
is related to another discussion in Chazal about exactly where was the Aaron Brit Hashem placed inside the Kodesh HaKodashim. And one of the ways that it calculates it basically says the Aaron didn't take up any space. Like the calculations are such that it was placed in a symmetrical point in the middle and it, it didn't take up any space. It's an object, but from a spiritual perspective, it is it, it has an aspect of it that is not from this world. It's the Ketav of Hashem on the Luchot that Moshe Rabbeinu hewed. Moshe Rabbeinu brought them up. This is the second time, the first time they smashed. The broken pieces, according to many, are inside the Aron as well. Um, uh, and, and what do you have inside? The, the new second set, hewn from the rock of Har Sinai, written again, Bichtav Yad Elohim, inside. And, and somehow, mysteriously, it's like it doesn't exist. It's like you're crossing a threshold to a space that's not, it's not really there. I physically it is there, but from a Ruhani perspective, it, it, it doesn't take up any space because it's not really of this world. You can't really capture in a dimension. The Dvir Habayit. There's more to say on it, but let's keep going. Right? So it's El Tachat Kanfe Akruvim. It's mentioning the Kruvim, but the Kruvim are already attached. No, this is the second set. Again, now we have those Kruvim, and the Kruvim are. They're sort of leaning on top in some way. Uh, the word sukkah is a canopy, something that, that, that goes over. So that's via sukkah akruvim, to cover something or to, to envelop it, but being over it. They pulled out the staves. And they stayed that way. They were not taken out. Larry, give me a minute. I got to finish this if you don't mind. Hold the thought. What's in the Aaron? They just want you to know. It's just the Luchot of Anim that Moshe put in Chorev. Again, which Luchot? Maybe both sets, maybe only one, right? But when they can't left Eretz Mitzrayim, there's a continuity. When they went outside, and the culmination of this section is now the cloud of glory comes. And fills it up, and the Kohanim cannot even go inside. And now we're going to come to the Tefillah of Shlomo as the next section. But it's all about bringing the Aaron in. And when the Aaron goes in, it's Lahavdol, the circuit is closed, and that enables the divine presence to arrive. Right? That's the moment of the coming full circle. And then we'll find out what Shlomo says. And well, Larry, please go ahead. What do you want to say or ask? I, I apologize because I think you covered this. Oh, there were two sets of Kruvim. Yeah, we spent a whole year on it, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago. There was That's why it's okay. No, no, not a problem. Just to remind you, so maybe someone else also doesn't know. Remember, there's the Kruvim, obviously, on the Aron Kodesh, the Kruvim made by Moshe Rabbeinu. That's on the Kaporet, Kaporet, the covering, which has the two Kruvim. But Shlomo is builds two massive structures uh, of the two uh, angelic looking uh, uh, figures. Uh, called Kruvim. We spent a lot of time trying to understand, like, what is he doing? Where, where did he get this idea? How could he do it? Uh, someone asked, you know, it's kind of like, is that a Vodazar or something? Like, what's he making? And these, the wingspan of it, the two of them, instead of standing facing each other, seem to be side by side, uh, where the edges of the outer edges of each of their wings uh, touched the, 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 the edge of the room of the 20 ama by 20 ama Kodesh Kodashim length by width. And they were massive. They were 10 amo tall. So, so there was a whole, we had a whole discussion about that, maybe a, a three shiurim ago, uh, three, two, three. Yeah, we were out of town. Uh, no, yeah. so, no, 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 no problem. But if you want to look it up while I'm, while I'm speaking, you could find it back in chapter, um, chapter six, talks about it in, in longhand. That's where it's described um, in, in um, chapter six, verse 14 and onward. You have the, 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 the Kirota by that starts mentioning about the, the Kruvim, these massive uh, uh, Kruvim that are, that are constructed. Um, and they're they're inside, and now what do you need a second set for? It's like the portable one had, had now has the the one that's fixed in the terra firma of of um, of Eretz Hakodesh uh, on all levels. It's the Kodesh Hakodesh, it's the, the the Holy of Holies, and um, it's something for for consideration that the the container of the of the Aaron is not only. Uh, uh, itself a container, but it's containers in the Kodesh Kodashim, but it also has the Kruvim on top of it, right? So when it had the Kruvim, we always, the Torah describes, we learned this last week, in fact, at the end of Parshat Naso, 
and it's also in Parsha Truma that way, Shem says, I will speak to you, not from objects, but from the space between the objects. And the idea that there isn't actually any physical object through which a Kodesh Baruch is speaking, it's in the space between. So you're making the, the setting, but the what goes in the setting is the divine presence that is not actually tangible, is not represented by anything. Now we have the Kruvim on the floor. So it's like the Shechina, you know, is, is still be Benchina Kruvim, but we have to fairly ask, you know, which Kruvim? And maybe the idea of the expansiveness of the, you know, the divine presence in the world, now that it's the place of Eretz Yisrael, the place of Yerushalayim, the place of Harabite, the place of Makom Mikdash, the place of Kodosh Kodoshim, Kodosh Kodoshim. So, um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next, next slide, if you will. Page 414 in the Mal Malachim Aleph, chapter, I mean, Malachim Aleph, chapter 8, verse 12. Az Amar Shlomo, Hashem Amal Ishkon Ba'arafel, Bano Baniti Beit Zvulach, Machol Shiftecha Olamim. We saw these psukim before. Then Shlomo spoke. Then Shlomo said, God said that he wanted to dwell in the Arafel. He wanted to dwell in the very thick, deep cloud. Look with me here, Rashi points out. Azamar Shlomo, when did he say this? Kishe ata ro'e ani shash amar, excuse me, said, ata now ro'e ani shashina shore babai shabaniti. And now that the cloud has arrived, now I see that the divine presence dwells uh, in the house that I built. That's what God promised. Um, that uh, God had already promised that he was going to dwell, if you will, from within the cloud. The point is the cloud is not really tangible. We can see it, but it's not actually tangible. And it, it conceals whatever is actually inside of it. Where was that from? Right? Right? I'll be seen on the Kaporet, which is in the book of Vayikra, chapter 20, uh, chapter 16, the section uh, known as Parshat Achremot, which we read on Yom Kippurim, right? So, Kach Shneaba Sifri, that's what it says, that's what it says, now, was Az uh, Amar Shlomo, now Shlomo said, because now when he saw the cloud, now he understood the, the connection, so, okay, that's what you wanted, right? Uh, Shelly, can you give me another minute just to finish this source? Certainly. Okay. So I want to, I just want to look at, at the next slide, which is say the Malbim. The Malbim explains Hashem Amalishkon Ba'arafel. The Malbim explains God said that He was going to dwell in the thick cloud. According to Malbim, God said that He was going to dwell in the in the the thick cloud, that's really what the Arafel is, meaning what he meant is not to connect it to a Pasuk from Parshat Achremot about the cloud equals this, but rather there was an earlier history. Har HaMoriah, right, was already the place where there's going to be a cloud. That's where Yitzchak already had the Akedah. That's its debut in Jewish history, in the Pshat. That's uh, the place where, not, not the Pshat, but that's according to Chazal, where Yitzchak Lasua Basadeh to converse in the field. That's the field. Again, according to Chazal, it's in that place that he sees the vision. Yaakov sees the vision of the, of the ladder. By the by, from Yaakov, the next person who has an experience in. Um, in that spot, that is uh, a, an encounter with a Kodesh Baruch Hu is, uh, or a Malach, or whatever, is David. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David. The Nigla Dutla David Begorin Aravna, the Eda Magefa. We saw that. That's chapter 24 of the end of the book of Shmuel. Can't go back there now, but that there's a Malach talking to him there. It's also the, the parallel version in Diriyamim Aleph. Viyada. He knew that this is the place that was designated. It's a place for, uh, the, the, for, for God and that this is the gate of heaven. He knew. So 
uh, since Hashem dwelt there in the dark cloud, meaning while the place was still no more than chaos, Tova Volek from creation, it was darkness and it was the thick cloud, Vahayahar, Vesadeh, Vigoren, while it was a mountain, a field, and a threshing floor. Now that I actually built a physical dwelling, a physical repository for you, I now I know that uh, uh, it is the, the place where you will uh, uh, reside for forever. The Pasuk, again, chap, verse 12 here is, 12, it's 12, 13, they go together. God said that he was going to dwell in the thick cloud until I built him this place. Now it's not the thick cloud of murkiness of Ahar, a Sadeh, and a Goren, a mountain, a field, a threshing floor, but rather it's a, a repository, a space. Now I see that this is going to be the place. So, v'nidmeh and uh, we can um, uh, imagine, it would seem, in his, um, in his allegory here of what he's saying, uh, as follows, the following allegory. Melech shedavka nafsh l'ava, lishkon b'makom echad, al sfat hayam, shaya makom kadosh be'inav, Uba o havo shall melech ubana lo shama paltarn gedolim ube bait mikdash melech. Shao hevalaz betuv, batuach, excuse me. She shema melech shama le olam. Dachar she yeshev bamakum hahu biyoto hare bishamem. Koshkin atem she yunsa sham bait banula talpiot. The allegory is as follows. There's a king who loved to, to he loved going to, to, to stay. At the beach, it was in his in his eyes a place that was sacred. His friend, the king's friend, meaning one of his subjects, but a beloved one of his subjects, came and built him there a great palace, and it was known as the great palace. And this person, who was the beloved of the king, was sure that the king would dwell in this place forever. That once he said he that that um, once he was willing to be in that place while it was still destroyed or desolate, all the more so now that it was built uh, to, you know, to a tower and it was built in a strong way that now for sure, because of its history, when things were murkier, now, now, there's, now there's clarity and we know for sure it'll be forever. And that's, that's what it says in, this, in the verse before, verse 12. Now that once he saw, once Shlomo saw that God agreed to dwell there, even in the in the mist, in the dark, in, not the mist, sorry, in the in the dark cloud, where the glory of God was so unclear, but it was shrouded. As it says in Tehillim 97, we say it every Friday night in Kabbalat Shabbat, right? The cloud and the dark cloud are around him. Mimele Adati, now I know. Aleph, I know two things. Aleph, Shebana Bano Baniti Beitzvul, Shepoishkon Bikviut. I know that now I was successful in building this repository. Here he will dwell for all time. Bet, Shabbatzvul Azayyam Achon Shifzacha Olamim. That this repository will be a spot, an abode for your dwelling, here not understanding it as Olamim in the temporal sense of olamim, which I translated myself earlier as forever, but rather spatially. <speaking in Hebrew> Meaning, says the Malbim, here, here in this space, here on planet Earth, here in this world, is the ikar hadira v'hashchina. This is the main place. Of the dwelling of the divine presence. Umasha Yashav Hashem, Vishkon Bechola, Sheshev Hashem, Vishkon Bechola Olamim, El Yonim, Ye Al Yede Hamikdash. Now the dwelling of God, even in all the other worlds, and there are many worlds, they're not physical worlds, but there are many, many worlds, right? 
So we don't believe in the universe. If people talk about the universe, we live in a universe, which means the one place where we are. Yeah? Multiverse. Now, are the other ones physical? No, they're not physical. As if the light, as it were, again, that's an allegory itself, will shine from the Mikdash to all the other worlds. This is the abode. This is the foundation of all of the structures, all of the palaces where the king will go into with his glory in all the worlds. This Mikdash, the temple, now says Shlomo HaMelech, declares Shlomo HaMelech, will be the most important principal palace. And now all of the other uh, abodes, all of the other places, in quotation marks, all of the other worlds, again, not physical worlds, they are all like what? Like the cells, like the rooms that are of the palace, but they're not the palace itself. They're not the main palace. Now go back in your mind's eye. When we spoke about the building of the Mikdash, we thought it was so strange that, okay, the dimension of the Mishkan was um, was uh, was uh, 10 by 30. So the sanctuary of the Mik- Mikdash was 20 by 60, right? So it doubled. And there was a thing with the height. But we were scratching our heads trying to figure out, wait, why in the Mikdash, in the Heichal of the Mikdash, the sanctuary, did Shlomo decide, you know what? I think on the outer area of the floor space of the Mikdash, I'm going to add some apartments. Now, they're not regular apartments, obviously, but I'm going to put cells, ta'im, little, little places on the side and on top and around. Like, these are not apartments for people. Yeah, what, what are they for? For storage, for different things. What, what was that about? The Malbim says it's a new model. Again, not that Shlom, I'm not suggesting Shlomo made it up. He had, remember, we talked about this a number of times. It was just for reinforcement. Shlomo has the plans he got from David. It says so in the in the Tanakh. Where did David get the plans? Chazal say he got it from Shmuel. Uh, where did Shmuel get it? Comes all the way back. Goes all the way back, and they're, they're from Har Sinai. Yeah, there still is some dimension of what Shlomo gets to innovate. We talked about that also previous year. Ein kan makom laharich, but the idea that there would be these cells. Now, I want you to understand what the Malbim is doing here. The, the Malbim is channeling, if you will, a great principle that is a very a, a important principle that the Hasidim picked up. Uh, Ayin Sham, look at the, the words, particularly in Hasidut, the most accessible that I've encountered is in the world of, uh, of, uh, of the writings of the Admor Hazaken of Chabad, where he talks about this, based on the Zohar Kodesh, Iker Dirab Tachtonim that the main dwelling of the Shechina is actually meant to be uh, lower down, meaning in our world. Uh, the Madrash, which I didn't give you, I probably should have given you, is that with the time period of different sins, the Shechina keeps getting farther and farther away, and it gets co- closer and closer thanks to righteous people and righteous generations. So it starts going back. Adam brings it down, uh, excuse me, Avram Avina brings it down, and then Yitzchak and Yaakov, it goes to generate, generate, generation until we get to, when's it the... At, the, at its zenith, in quotation marks, because it's backwards, it's when it's at its lowest point, meaning most accessible, again, the days of Shlomo Melech. The Malbim says, here are these two psukim, the, what, what, um, and he's reading it from the Pshat. I mean, he didn't mention anything from, you know, a Zohar or something. The Malbim's just saying, the two psukim here say, I saw that God originally said, Hashem Amar Lishkon Ba'arafel. Where did I see that? It's the Akeda. It's Yitzchak Lasua Basadeh. It's Yaakov having a dream about it, the ladder. It's David coming to Goran Aravna and having an encounter with a Malach. That just happened for Shlomo a few decades ago in his father's life. Now that's statement number one. Statement number two, because I built this place, now that I've built this place and I see that that's now your choice, that's Hashem, what you wanted us to do. This will now be your place 
not for all time, that goes without saying, because that was already true, even when you dwelt, so to speak, in the cloud, in the in the, the thick cloud, the, the Anan and the Arafel. Now it's all the Olamim. Whatever way in which, again, it's, you know, say, well, that's totally mystical. Yes, but okay. So that whatever way Hashem, who is totally transcendent and beyond time and space, relates to the world through a concept that for an, uh, the purpose of an allegory, we use the language of it being worlds, right? As if there was like a, as if it was like a physical distance, even though it's really not. But Mo Shlomo Melech says, from now on, this is the place. This will be the place. And everything that will happen elsewhere in the universe, so to speak, or the multiverse, right? This is the physical one. The rest is all Baruch Niyot. It's all going to be headquartered here, Ribbon Sha'olam. He's not telling God what to do. He's saying, that's what you meant. That's what you wanted. He's conveying to the people how central the Beit HaMikdash is. And what's the dugma for it? I'm ad-libbing from the words of the of the Malbim, but I think this is what he means. The rest of the worlds are the ta'im. They're the cells, the apartments, the again, the, the units that are built around the, the building itself. And that's the dugma, the, the image of it is actually how they built it. There was the inner part and the part around. Okay, so that's Rashi just thinks, no, Azamar Shlomo means when he saw the cloud, he said, oh, now I see you want to dwell in the cloud, just like it was true in the Torah, in Parshat Achremot, Kibe Anan Erel Kaporet, when the cloud comes, the divine presence is there. It happened so many times in the in the um, in the time in the midbar. Obviously, the cloud of Hashem was over the Mishkan. Right? Rashi uh, focuses on that particular pasuk um, in Parshat Achremot for a very simple reason. That's the one that's at the initiative, in a certain way, of in quotation marks of the Kohen Gadol. Right? I say initial in quotation marks because not the coin God has decided one fine day. Here's the instruction. Here's you come to the Kodesh, the Kodesh Shim. How do you access it? Here's what you do. Here are the steps. Right? That's why it's Achremot. They let him not die when he comes to the Kodesh. Let him do it the right way, the right steps. Okay, so that's a particular time. That's the holiest time. That's in the month of Tishrei, Yom HaKippurim. When are they gathering? In the month of Tishrei. So it's it, it fits why Shlomo Melch is mentioning this idea. Yeah? Um, for in Rashi, uh, for for what Malik didn't quote, which I was a bit surprised. Why didn't he also say that at the Akeda there was a cloud tethered to the mountain? There was already the cloud. Remember, Vayar uh, Mirachok. So Rashi, I guess it wasn't the Pshat. So right, but they but they saw the place from afar. What does Rashi say? Anan Kashur Al They saw there was a cloud tethered to the mountain already there. Right, so the concept was already uh, extant. Maybe he didn't want to say it because in the case of. Um, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and David, there was no cloud per se, but the divine presence was still there. Anyway, okay. That's, I, I know, a mouthful and a lot to digest, but I'll pause I'll pause here. And um, Shelly, go ahead. And then Karen, I think, okay. had a comment also. Shelly, go ahead, please. All right. In verse 12, who is Shlomo talking to? Himself, because you said in the Monday class when it doesn't say that anybody, who somebody is talking to, that it could be themselves, or is he talking to the people because in verse 14, he's going to turn his face. So he seems to be away from the people. Love now, my, not clear. Okay. Correct. Not, not clear. clear. Not okay. clear. My biggest Did he exclaim problem. it? Did he say it? It's not, um, it's not clear. It's not okay. clear. Now, I, 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 will, I will throw in for good measure. It was the next thing I was going to say, but it seems it, it will maybe sound less radical now. As Amar Shlomo, Hashem Amar. Vayomer Elokim Yehi Or, Vayihi Or. Vayomer Elokim Yehi Rakia, et cetera, et cetera. Vayomer Elokim, Vayomer Elokim, Vayomer Elokim. Here Shlomo HaMelech, through his Amira, now that the whole thing was made, now that we spoke about, you know, the end of the creation, if you will, Kol HaMelacha, Amar, he, uh, he said, Hashem, you had said. Now, where did Hashem say, Lishkon Bara fell? The Amira we're talking about here is not a, a phonetic, it's not, it's not a sound, it's not audit, audible. But the Lashon Amira is Lashon, a, a Lashon of um, designation, a Lashon of expression of will. As Amar Shlomo, Hashem Amar, you said. So now, what did I do? I did something physical to build this. And here's my statement of what, what it's going to be. 
Okay. Shem is uh, given uh, Shlomo HaMelech great uh, latitude, if you will, in the building, the construction, and the setting up of the program, if you will, of what it is. Um, and this, uh, Shlomo is just saying, this was the plan for all time. The pro- There's one big, another big problem, at least for me on this. I built. I never heard Moshe say, I built. I think this is why the pro- what the problem is that this isn't going to last long. There's always been the question of yep. whether they were supposed to have a king or whether that it was just permissible. And if everybody was supposed to be a nation of priests, even though there are designated jobs, then it's it's just allowed. It's 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 a default when because I know you're going to ask for it as opposed to what I want. So the idea that Shlomo as the king is saying Use that language instead of the people built, or you know, he just wouldn't have gotten that from Moshe. That's why this is going to fall apart because there is too much of this idea of of I have done it. The completion and and in you know he he does say in his speech later on oh yeah you, we have to do the right thing you have to do the right thing blah 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 but that could just be thrown in and, I don't know. well I, I'm not gonna go with blah I'm, I like everything he's saying except for the blah 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 part I think it's <laughs> it's being too dismissive about one of the most important programmatic uh, discourses that we have in Tanakh. Uh, about Yerushalayim and about the Makam HaMikdash. Um, I, I join with you, though. It is curious that he said, Bano Baniti, I built, I built, instead of, um, you know, um, they built or something like that. And I'm not sure what to make of it. I didn't see in the Mepharshim anyone who um, who is critical per se, but th- there is there is a question there. I think it's, it's certainly legitimate. Why did he, why did he put it... Um, you know, on, on, on himself. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, it's, it's a the question. I, I don't know. And I think, uh, I think it's a fair question to be asked again. I didn't, I didn't look at every single source in Chazal. Um, and maybe I have to go back and do my homework. Maybe there was an element there of, um, uh, of, of hubris that was a little bit misplaced. Uh, then again, you know, he doesn't say I built this house for me. He said, Bando Baniti Lach. I built it for you, Hashem. It's like, you know, I did it, but it's not, I did it. It's, I did it for you. You know, I didn't do it for me. I, it's still, I did it as opposed to the people did it. I know, but I'm, I'm wondering if that isn't sort of anachronistically, you're sort of anachronistically like imposing a de- democratic, you know, uh, or whatever it is, a postmodern formulation of like to speak with the we and be inclusive. Or so. I, I just, I don't know. I'm not discounting what you're saying. I'm just saying we have to be a little careful that we're not, um, What's the word? Projecting our way of speaking, you know, too much on the um, uh, onto the, um, the 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 people in in the Tanakh. I just I just don't I'm, know. I'm not projecting. I'm looking back to Moshe. I'm not looking 21st century. I'm looking back to Moshe mm-hmm. and and what he would have said and what he did say and how he you know it it, it yeah. even the, Rabbi Saxon used to say that. That's a good point. It's a good point. That that um, even the building of the Mishkan was because of this. Would the Mishkan have been built if you didn't have the sin of the golden calf? That's a good question. We don't have a good answer, but right. So discussion. That, but but I thought you were going to say everyone had to participate. Everybody had to give in. Everybody's part of it. And uh, there, I think there there is an element here. I spoke about this a few weeks ago. Also, I think this is a Rav Meidan piece that um, there was a lot more top down going on here about it being built. I mean, it was a national enterprise. So anyway, I want to give other people a chance to speak also. I have Debbie, I have Karen, and I think Karen also put in a comment, which I still haven't right. seen. Uh, Debbie first. And Helen, Karen. Helen and give Helen. me a minute. Debbie, okay, so Debbie, Karen, I, Helen. Okay, Debbie, Karen, Helen. Sorry. Okay, go. Debbie. I totally disagree because um, thank God the Jewish people were in a very different place by the time Shlomo was building the temple than they were when Moshe was leading them out of um, right. Egypt. And um, in the other class, and a, a number of people on this call were in the other class where we studied uh, uh, Shmuel, the, because it was before the pandemic, the teacher was able to bring all this extra material where I thought I'd be bored on a big, with, you know, every- Every little detail where 
we could actually see it in terms of how the temple, and it was even for me, the big picture thinker, the most amazing thing. I loved it. Yeah, and okay, I want to okay. go, yay, because we're in it, just like, like today on Tish when we're, you know, mourning, but I remember being at a, a share from the Blitzstein's woman, Rosh Chodesh, whatever yeah. rabbi, who actually addressed it. We're mourning now, but condos are selling for a million dollars minimally in Yerushalayim, and we need to be happy and celebrate. I hear that's it. That's how I feel. I hear it. This. Okay. I totally, I totally hear it. I don't think Shelly was being critical of the notion of the Mikdash altogether. The point is, there is a contrast between the Mishkan and the Mikdash. You don't have anybody saying, like, we built, I, I built this, right? And and in the end, it does actually mention in the Torah that in the end, as far as Chazal are concerned, it gives Moshe credit for putting up the Mishkan. And Chazal say, literally, he was the one somehow it's Moshe Rabbeinu, so yeah, Hashem gave him the strength. He put together the whole thing himself, so he would get credit. It was like all on him, but he didn't ever said it. And as Larry pointed out in the comments here, Bano Baniti is emphatic. It's a kefal son. It's like, I, I, I built it, I built it. So there, maybe there is a question I, here. And um, I feel like, and and I uh, I have obviously the same level of respect for Moshe that everybody yeah, yeah, else sure. does, but in a way it's difficult if we're come because of who he was, and that's why Hashem chose him, just like Abraham. I think that sometimes, yeah. you know, it's difficult to make those comparisons yeah. I understand. because of who Moshe was yeah. or who Abraham was. Yeah. So far, there has not yet been, apparently, in the history of the world, a perfect human being, apparently. <laughs> so not, not Shlomo HaMelech. <laughs> And not Moshe Rabbeinu, but we're all working on it. We're trying to, we're trying our best. Anyway, thanks for that. Let me ask. I want to give Karen a chance, and Helen's waiting right. also. So Karen and Helen, go ahead, Karen, please. Okay, I just want to give this a more Hasidic viewpoint because that's always my that's always my viewpoint. Why not? Um, and that is uh, nothing exists anywhere besides Hashem. So the idea okay. that there is a place, and that's the place. And he comes and he comes and he goes. It, 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 this is just an invention in our minds. It's something that is done for our benefit. It's we who need to make a journey to a place physically to mirror the spiritual journey that we are supposed to be making at the same time. We come closer, we move farther. And when we are closer, the curtains part and we sense the shahina okay it, it, it's 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 just just turn it all over on its on its head it, it's I, I certainly hear it, it. i certainly hear it but i want to i want to push back on one little point okay. i say it as okay. someone who wrote, helen give me a minute i just i want to say something okay. that 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 actually uh just on one piece you know this is part of the debate and the discussion uh that's ongoing that involves uh some of the ways that Hasidut, excuse me, views the world, which uh, is some of what the um, those who are not in the olam of Hasidut sometimes, I don't say take issue with, but there is a, a debate going on. Is we're 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 trying to reconcile the reality that there is a physical world that Hashem did create, which is not God. It's the world. The Bore and the Bria are not the same. And the fact that the Bore and the Bria are not the same means that uh, there is some kind of a, a distance in quotation marks. How do we bridge it? You know, and it's not, it's not that it's, and that's the mystery though, is that right. it's, it's not it's illusory, but it's not physical. So, and that's what, when you keep reading, we'll see that's actually in the, in the, in the tefillah itself. That's what Shlomo Melch himself is going to marvel at, right. you know, but, um, I don't want us to give Shlomo such a hard time. It's true. He said, no. but it's true. All these things are true. Um, but, and your point is well taken. I just want to point it's out, the like there are the thought, thoughts in the world. The you want to claim the world's not real. Everything is just a, oh, just no, fake. It's, it's, real. Not, it's real. Hashem made it. It's and he wants real. us to live right. in it. And that's what the mitzvahs are. They're doing physical actions uh, uh, or, or speaking Absolutely. certain things or mental, you know, a, mind, a mindset that are relating us to HaKadosh Baruch, who is beyond us, beyond time and space, beyond our comprehension, mystery, hate done mystery. But, um, but, but we just but, have to remember that. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, fine. That's yeah. All. But, but I, the reason I'm here. signaling this just to lay the, my, my cards out, I'm signaling this because sometimes if, if the worldview 
is taken to too far an extreme, it mm -hmm. starts to come to the point where, and there were antinomian movements in Judaism at certain times, uh, and some that still exist today, who would then said things like, well, the mitzvahs, he doesn't really care if we do them or not, or we don't really have to keep this mitzvah, that mitzvah. It's just to get to the point of what the mitzvah is meant to make us feel. So we'll just feel it. Oh, we don't actually have to do it. You understand? And that's where, and, that, and that's where I'm showing yeah. like, and that's something we have to avoid or, 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 or forestall from becoming sort of the, 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 the idea. And that was, it is an ongoing, I would say a dialogue between the world of Hasidut and the world that is sometimes referred to as the world of the Mik Nagdim. Debbie, before I come back to you, Helen's been waiting so patiently. I want to give Helen a chance. Okay. I think Larry, it's not okay. sure. He texted a few things. So Helen, go ahead. You waited so patiently. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm worrying about the Arafel. So Hashem knows that we need pomp and circumstance. He understands our need of spectacle. But he himself eschews splendor and spectacle. And so he keeps himself encapsulated in a separate kind of atmosphere. And so the duality or the unduality of where what we need to see and feel and what he uh, avoids splendor is a very important thing. And to give an example, in royal coronations, the monarch is always on this spectacular throne in front of everybody. And so this shows the difference of Hashem not wanting to be involved in splendor and keeping his private space. So that's what I thought. <laughs> that's very nice. That's very nice. And 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 uh, we need we need the splendor. We need the building. And so even right. though, and even the cloud, by the way, you know, God is not actually in the cloud. If he's in the cloud, then he's physical. He's just hidden. He's, he's the God behind the curtain. Uh-uh. No, 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 right. no, no. You understand? And again, that's just like, that's what, that's what Karen's saying also. And she, she's right. Like, yeah, this is, this is, this is all, this is all an allegory to understand it. You know, what's going on? What's the, but, but it is also real. In as much as that's our relationship to it, and it's it, you could just as easily have heard someone say, and someone did say, and many millions of people say, Jerusalem. It could be it could be in Italy, it could be in Rome. We could just build it there. It doesn't really matter. Oh, 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 oh. so we say no, no, no. We're not going to do that. So you understand? And and again, and there, there have been a number of antinomian movements, some of which are outside of Judaism, sometimes some grew out of Judaism. Some are within Judaism, that if you ask them, uh, they'll tell you in, in earnest, like uh, when the Torah says, don't eat milk and meat together, it's not a mitzvah from a Kodesh Baruch Hu, it's uh, an animal uh, kindness to animals, because you can't cook a kid in its mother's milk. It's God keep care if I eat a cheeseburger. So the Orthodox uh, student, let's say in, uh, I don't know, in the, in the high school, meets the Reform rabbi, so the Reform rabbi, it's very, it's beautiful that the reform rabbi says to the student, you know, I want you to just realize that uh, God cares that we shouldn't be cruel to animals. But the Orthodox student says, but excuse me, is there a mitzvah we're not allowed to eat uh, chazer? Is there a mitzvah we're not allowed to eat milk and meat? The reform rabbi would say, I don't, I have a different view of what the word mitzvah means. It's a folk tradition. It's a this, a that. And the, the student is saying, but Akash Baruch spoke this at Har Sinai. Yes. Yes or no? Well, he spoke, he communicated, it was an allegory. The, the student saying, Hashem gave us mitzvahs, the Tariq mitzvahs. We're obligated to do them. And not to eat milk and meat means not to eat milk and meat. I, the Torah phrased it that way, so I have to understand why the Torah phrased it that way, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So we're, we're, we're right, that, that's, that, that, and that's what I see going on here as well. Dabi, I think you had something, again, you wanted to say, or is that from before? Quickly, I, I, I sat quiet about this in the Monday class when you were talking about Abraham and Sarah and the Machpelah and the trip. And so I have to speak up now because there had been many emotional and spiritual days on the Oratora mission trip. But there was something 
very special about physically being in the space of the Machpelah. So as much as I feel like I have a personal relationship with Hashem and talk to him every day and all of that, which I do, I, I still feel that the physical space is important. Nahon, didn't, let me give a great example, right? From, from Ripped from the headlines, right? Um, didn't we all discover during COVID you could dive beautifully in your house? But we have a Masora, and our Masora from the time of the first exile is that we build shuls when we live not in Eretz Yisrael, even in Eretz Yisrael, but, and that that's the place through the being the repository where the Sifrei Torah are stored in the community. That's the place where the Shechina dwells. That, that's halacha. Decide to make it up. It's halacha. It's a Gemara and Megillah. That's halacha psuka. And uh, uh, there's a certain Kedushat Makom to that place. And, and you know, it's becoming like a pitch for, for, you know, go to shul, go to shul. But but there is something to it. Absolutely. I, is Hashem not everywhere? It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the Uncle Moishi problem that the children figure out. Like, Hashem is here, Hashem is there. He's truly everywhere. So why do I have to face east? To face any direction? It's true. If you didn't know, that's what you would do. Yeah. And uh, that's what the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, right? But the Shulchan Aruch still tells you, if you don't know which direction is up and down and east, west, north, south, you don't know how to get, how to aim toward Eretz Yisrael. So you should aim in your heart towards the Kodesh HaKodeshim. In Yerushalayim, you're a Kodesh. Debbie, you're muted. I can't hear you. No, you're still muted. To your point, being at our Torah this past Shabbos, which I was, as you know. I saw you, I know. The first time since the pandemic was really special for me. Thank you. I'm glad it was special for you. It was special for me, too. Your grandson did a beautiful Adam's Mirror, so it was all good. So um, yeah. it's all good. I just want to clarify one thing. I wasn't, Khalila disagreeing with Karen with what you were saying. You are, you're right. I, I, I didn't want to Khalila make it seem like I'm, I'm saying it's what you're saying. I can't accept. I accept. It's right. I'm just pointing out on a certain continuum taken to an extreme. Could it be misconstrued? It could be. It was. And it still is. And this was part of the, and part is still now, part of the ongoing debate sort of, and it's not really a debate of uh, um, correct or incorrect. It's a question of degrees in a certain, on a certain level on this matter between uh, the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, if you will. And not that Hasidim, Khalila, Khalila, Hasidim are not antinomian, um, except in some minor cases where Misnagdim accused them of being so. And that was one of the early, that was, it was one of the early stressors between the two, because certain things having to do with, let's say it straight, let's say time was a vector that got, that got messed, messed around with, to put it in a very colloquial manner. Like, does God care if you daven in the morning, shachrit? What if you daven shachrit and it's two in the afternoon? He's not waiting for you to feel this. Hashem waits forever to feel this. So by the misnag saying, you know, there's a zman and we didn't make it up. It's in it's in the Gemara and it's in the halacha. And um, and there are Simpson, and, uh, whatever, whatever. You want to daven mincha? The story of the Karliner mincha is at midnight. Now it is the hinterland of the Ukraine. So it wasn't like it was actually six hours after sunset, but it wasn't exactly... Daylight, the davening mincha, but that mincha, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so the misnagim is saying to them, well, actually, the time vector does matter, and you know, and whatnot. And part of that is playing out, you know, in, in, in other ways also with with grave sites, grave sites and places in Ukraine, grave sites and places in Romania, grave sites and places in New York. That there's a question there about like these are important, and you know, to the point about also about Hebron, these are important places to go and to daven to Hashem in those places. But uh, when does the pendulum sort of swing away from keeping Yerushalayim at the center and off to these other things out of necessity? Because we can't get to Yerushalayim because Yerushalayim is you know, laid waste and they don't let Jews in. And when are we just kind of like sticking, sticking around in a gullus mentality when we have Yerushalayim? And the best, of course, of all the examples is what happens annually in Meirun the largest gathering of Orthodox Jews for prayer um, 
uh, annually in Eretz Yisrael, not the Kotel. It's Meron. It's very hard to understand. Anyway, okay, I digress. All right, I have so much more to say, but I will exercise a little bit of self-discipline today and I'll conclude the shear right now. But when we get back next week, God willing, we'll be doing, uh, you know, I guess it's chapter eight, part two B. Um, and we'll be talking about the next section from Yud Bet through till Chaf Aleph about the opening of the gates. We saw some of it already today, about the movement of the Arn Kodesh and, the, you know, but, um, but we have to get to the next phase, which is, which is, I think, a crucial one before we can look at the tefillah itself even, which is the request to the open the gates. But for that, you have to come back next week. So uh, I wish everyone a great week. Again, Sunday.